our God and beautiful things. Beautiful things, our God. God, fear, beautiful things, our God. Copy, copy, copy. So I'm last. I like it. Good morning, Grace Church. Happy New Year. We're going to do an oldie but a goodie. It's Majesty Crown Him by Chris Tomlin. So let's stand up and let's sing with all of our hearts because that's why we're here, isn't it? Amen.
majesty, Lord of all, let every throne before him fall, the King of kings, O oh, come adore our God, who reigns forever.
your rest, still your happiness that you fear in the fire. Cause fear, he is a liar. When he told you your trouble, when he told you your storm, when he told you you should run away and never find a home When he told you you were dirty When he told you you're ashamed When he told you you find the one Grace could never change Cause fear he is a liar He will take your breath Stop you in your steps fire cause fear he is a liar amen let your fire fall and cast out all my fears let your fire fall your love is all I feel let your fire fall and cast out all my fears let your fire fall, your love is all I feel. Let your fire fall and cast out all my fears. Let your fire fall, your love is all I feel. Let your fire fall and cast out all my fears. Let your fire fall, your love is all I your fear in the fire cause fear he is a liar cause fear he is a liar hey Amen. good morning please be seated want to welcome everyone this morning to Grace Church. If you're a visitor, we're super glad you're here. Want to make sure that if you are here for the first time that you walk away with one of these. So everybody who's working out in the lobby, make sure everyone gets one of those. There's all kinds of goodies in there. Um, my name is Sherry. I'm blessed to be the pastor here. I know we have some folks here for the first time. We want to make sure that you know how welcome you are. Let's welcome them right now. Woohoo! <laughs> I um, want to invite you to fill out the Let's Connect card that is in the seat back. And if you are a technical person, you can grab the card that has the little skew box on it. I do not know of what I'm talking about, but that's what they told me to say. There's a little box that you can scan. It'll take you right to a Let's Connect card. And there, thank you, Charlie. There is one that also has the, uh, the message notes in it. So you can follow along as I preach. Now, you know, uh, Happy New Year, everyone. Yeah, I'm going to say it again, and I want you to holler back. Happy New Year! Happy New Year! Oh, that was great. That was great. You know, this is the time of the year when people um, often say, this year I'm going to do things a little bit differently. And if doing something in your spiritual walk is on your list of things that you want to do differently this year, we have some tools for you. One is our Dive Deep Bible Engagement Program. Um, we have this online. If you go to egracechurch.com, there are instructions for you. There's three ways for you to engage with the Bible. One is where you just kind of dip your toe in, just get your toe a little bit wet. Another one is where you go wading in the water, and the other one is a belly flop all the way down to the bottom. I mean, you really, really get into it, dive deep. So um, this is out there in the welcome area, and they are on either end here if you're exiting out these doors. We also have, if this is the year that you want to 
you want to deepen your, your prayer life, we have a prayer and fasting guide. This is really helpful. Um, I started fasting because I, I helped in the creation of this, and I said, you know what, I'm going to start doing that, and it's opened new doors of revelation in my life. If you are thinking, today is the day, this year is the year, today's the day, I'm going to start doing a daily devotional. We have daily breads out there that you can grab. If this is the year, are you, are, are you with me? We've got some tools for you, folks. If this is the year you want to just learn how to listen to God, you just want to learn how to be still and know that I am God and maybe get a revelation here or there, this is the tool for you. It's called How to Listen to God. If this is the year you want to engage in the New Testament, you go right out there. There's New Testaments for you. There are small groups. That's why we send out emails every single week. I don't want to ask who opens them, but I want to tell you, if you're not opening them, you're missing out on small groups and Bible studies and, and all kinds of stuff that's going on. If, if, if this is the year, if this is the day that you want to take a step forward with Jesus, we have resources, but guess what? you got to take the steps. We're going to provide you with the tools you need, but you need to make the move. So the, I'm using all kinds of mixed metaphors. The ball's in your court. The tools are in your hands. You're getting what I'm saying, right? And then really, really cool, if you get into a small group, other people are doing the same thing you're doing, feel free to contact your pastor and invite her out for coffee. You know I love my coffee. And we can talk about the stuff that you're learning. Make this the year that you grow in your relationship with Jesus. I will, I will um, stop because I could just preach a whole sermon about that right now. I think I just about did. Um, <laughs> so... Lots of resources available. Um, I want to um, invite you now to consider how you might tithe this morning or give an offering to God um, because the, the thing about Grace Church, the thing that we want to do is make sure that materials like this get into your hands, that we're able to have the website that can read the Bible to you every day, that we're able to have the classes and the materials and all that stuff, all of that happens because of your tithes and offerings. And it is so that people can know the truth about Jesus Christ. It's not so we can fill pews and it's not so we can be popular. It's so that people can know Christ and, and walk with Christ through their life. Amen? So I'm going to say a prayer, and I, I do want to invite you. There's a bunch of ways to give. You can give online. You can text to give. You can drop it by the office or drop it in these little black boxes um, on the way out. But I just want you to know that your tithes and offerings are accomplishing great things in our community, great things. So, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and God, we've dreamt our entire lives of being involved in great things and doing great things, and what we've come to discover, God, is that you're the greatest and that we want to partner with you. We want to ride on your coattails and watch the miracles in our community. God, we love you, and we thank you for this opportunity to give. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. God makes some beautiful things. Everything he makes is beautiful. Let's stand up and sing about it. A little faster. All this pain I wonder if I'll ever find my way I wonder if my life could really change at all. All this earth, could all that is lost ever be found? Could a garden come up from this ground at all? Yeah. 
You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of the dust. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of us. All around, hope is springing up from this old ground. Out of chaos, life is being found in you. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of the dust. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of us. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of the dust. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful. So I have to, t I have to say to, the, to my friends in the booth, good luck, because um, <laughs> I was all over the place at the 8.30 this morning, so good luck, friends. If the slides aren't up on the screen in a timely fashion, it's me. 
All right, so, um, so I want to say, you know, there's a lot of milestones in kids' lives. Uh, for those of you who have raised kids or have nieces and nephews, you, you'll find when we, when we get right up in their little faces, um, we're trying to teach them how to say words. You know, we want them to speak. And, and often there's a competition between parents, mom and dad, and grandparents to see which name the kid is going to say first. And so my grandkids, I fully expected them to come out and say, Grandmama, you know, like I lost that challenge, but they're adorable. And then, and then when our little slobber machines finally say something like, Bah, we're like, oh, she's a genius. She's asking for her bottle. She's smarter than any baby on the planet. Well, that's adorable. Everything is new. They're saying everything for the first time, and it's hilarious, and their pronunciation is wrong, and it's all good until, until we hear that word that strikes the terror into every single parent. It's time to take a bath. Why? I should say it like my friend. Let's tuck you in for a nap. Why? Y you know, oh, and then come fully formed questions. Why is the sky blue? Why do I have to go to bed? Why do I have to eat vegetables? On and on and on and on and I swore when I became a parent that I was not going to say, you know about what I'm about to say right now, you know, why? Because, yeah, I swore I'd never do that. It lasted about a day. So today we're starting a brand new series and it's called Asking for a Friend. And, and in this series, we are going to ask questions, and, and some of them might be questions that you are asking or maybe your friends are asking, and I'm really excited about this sermon series because uh, in the faith tradition that I grew up in, there was no room for questions. Questions were considered rebellion, and, and that was punishable, and um, I had a lot of questions, right? I mean, from the time I was a... a, a a little kid, I had questions about God. Is God real? Is, uh, what does God want from me? See, in, in my school that I grew up in, we had reading, writing, arithmetic, and sandwiched between reading and arithmetic was religion. Now, reading, writing, and arithmetic, these are, these are concrete things. Two plus, hey there, Two plus two is four. We could put a problem up on the board. We could diagram a sentence. This is how you spell cat. These are concrete things. But then we get taught this religion class, and we, we start talking about God, and, and God's not, you know, particularly in the mind of a child, this is not a concrete thing. Nothing we can diagram on the board. Nothing we can spell out. So, so in my mind... I had, I had problems, I, I, and I couldn't see him. I could see a math problem. I, I couldn't touch him. I couldn't comprehend him, and I couldn't ask any questions, so I did just enough to, to pass the drills that we had every single week. I don't know what your experience was like. I've talked to several parents this week, several parents who are saying, you know, in our house, we want people to be free to have questions. We want our kids to be free to, to have questions. What a great thing. I, I wonder if some of us had been free to ask questions and free to discuss things and free to, to grapple with, with things um, how our relationship with God might have developed differently. Don't you wonder that? Some of you grew up in, in households where, where you heard about God all the time and you were allowed to have discussion, and I'm so happy for you. Some grew up in houses where there was no talk of God, and so all of this is new. You've got loads of questions, and, and some just um, are questioning things we were taught just wondering, just wondering. So I want to say to you, um, don't be afraid of your questions. Don't, don't hide your questions. We want this place to be a place where you can come and ask questions. Um, 
In this sermon series, we're going to bring some common questions to light. And what we believe is that these questions are going to be a pathway for you, for you to experience revelation from God. Not because I said something, not because somebody said something to you a long time ago, but because you're asking the creator of the universe, the lover of your soul, the Holy Spirit, who, who is also known as the teacher, to reveal these things to you as you go. God is not afraid of your questions, all right? He's really, really not. He knows you have them anyway. So we're going to ask questions like, is the Bible reliable and relevant? Why is there so much suffering? Is the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament different? Because, man, when you read the Bible, it seems like that's so. Is the world coming to an end, and is there life after death? And, and today, we're starting with this question, what do I do with my doubt? You know, we've, we've talked about the fact that we have questions, and, and so when we have questions, there might be this seed of doubt in our minds about the things we talk about around here, the things that we hear in, in songs or things that we were taught when we were kids about God. You know, it's this feeling of, of uncertainty. I wonder if that's so. I wonder if that's true. You know, I was taught this, but I'm not sure about this. And when it comes to, to faith, doubt can have a... a a long-range impact. Some people, and some people in, in this very room, and we embrace you and love you, and it's okay because this is the place, even if you would doubt the existence of God, even if you believe in God, but you're not sure about this Jesus stuff, and even if you think Jesus is a historical character, we know Jesus lived, but did he really go to the cross? Did he really die and rise from the dead? It sounds, um, it sounds very, very strange, doesn't it? It's hard to believe. I think when I read the Gospels, those Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I think sometimes it's easier to doubt than it is to do what Jesus says. You know, uh, that love your enemies stuff, did he really mean that? I want to say I doubt it because you know I don't want to do that. <laughs> when I'm hurt or I'm angry, you know, man, it's hard. And when I read the Bible, I know I'm not the only one who has doubts. Um, Jesus had these disciples. They were the, the top-tier disciples, okay, the, the guys that he had spent three years with. And he gave them their marching orders. It was called the Great Commission. He told them to go into the world and to tell people near and far about him. And, and it says in the scripture, top tier, okay, the, the guys that he had been teaching all along, they've witnessed his miracles, they've heard his teaching, they've seen him rise from the dead. Scripture says they worshiped and some doubted. Oh, wow. Three straight years with Jesus, and still they struggled with doubt. Well, I don't know if that, if that relieves me or makes me sad, but what it does tell me is that I'm in good company. Amen? I'm in good company. Now, perhaps the most famous doubter in human history is one of the disciples named Thomas. Now, I, I, don't, I don't think he really... This poor guy, I don't think he deserves to be known for eternity as Doubting Thomas. If that was the case, it'd be Doubting Sherry, Doubting Charlie, Doubting Champ, Doubting Bill, Doubting everybody, right? We've all had doubts. So here's, here's this story about this, this very famous doubter, the most famous doubter out there. Uh, so, Easter has happened. Easter is when... God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, raises Jesus from the dead. He had gone to the cross and died. He was in the tomb for three days. God raised Jesus from the dead. And, and what, had, so what had happened was is that the disciples were in this upper room. They were terrified, terrified, because what they thought 
was that if word got out that they were followers of Jesus, that the same thing that had happened to Jesus was going to happen to them. So they were hiding in this upper room, and Jesus shows up. And, and I love this about Jesus because I'm, I can only imagine how terrifying <laughs> that would be. This man that you clearly saw die, uh, show up, like walk through a wall and show up in your midst. And so the first thing he says is, peace be with you. You know, tranquilo, I'm, it's okay, it's okay. They were filled with joy. They were, they were surprised. They were just out of their minds, I'm sure. And um, there, there was a problem, though. Let's look at the scripture. Uh, John 20, 24 to 29. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. And he said, nah. Right? Nah. That's impossible. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were in his side. I'm not going to believe this. I'm not going to believe this. And then a week later, I want you to pay attention to this. A week later, a week later, a week later. This is important. They're in the house again. Thomas is with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said again, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, and he was talking about you here. All right? He's talking about you. He says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those, read this with me, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Did you know that you were in the Bible? Poor Thomas, though. Poor Thomas. On Easter, Jesus appears to the remaining disciples. Remember, um, Judas had left the group, and, and Thomas just missed out on the whole thing. We have no idea why. Uh, maybe he went out to, to scout out to see how dangerous things are. Maybe he went out for, I don't know, fast food or a cup of coffee or whatever. But um, whatever happened, whatever caused him to leave, he missed out on the most important thing that was ever going to happen in world history, this, this resurrected visitation of Jesus. And if you could imagine, <laughs> he's out doing whatever he's doing. And, and he... He's like the other guys. You know, they've, they've witnessed Jesus dead. They've also witnessed the death, they think, of their, of their ministry, the death of hope. Jesus was going to be the one. He was the Messiah. It's all up and to the right from here. But he was dead, and they're in hiding. So Thomas is making his way back up to the upper room and he opens the door and it's a party going on. These elated disciples and they can't wait to see him and they can't wait to tell them, tell him. And he's wondering, I'm thinking, did they get into the wine? What is with these guys? And then the ones who saw Jesus. They kept recounting the story and they're, they're piecing it together and they're like, no man, he was here and and can you believe it? And they're just so excited and they're, they're shouting and they're hugging and here's Thomas. Not buying it. Whatever the difficulty Thomas had, we can understand, can't we? How he would doubt these reports. One thing that I want to really emphasized this morning is that, you know, Thomas saw Jesus die and then when he was told that Jesus had risen from the dead, he didn't believe. He did not believe. And I love the grace that these disciples, imperfect as they were, gave Thomas. They gave room for Thomas's doubts. 
It says in the scripture, it says, um, a week later, the disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. They invited Thomas to belong even though he didn't believe. They didn't boot him out because he wasn't just right in step with them, believing everything they believed and just how he believed, just how they believed it. They did not make him leave because he didn't believe. What a gift this is. There was no fights, there was no debates, there was no demands on Thomas to get with the program. I want to ask, what if we created a welcoming space full of grace where people could come in with all their doubts, with all their questions, and, and, and allow them the same grace that was given to us when we came through the doors of a church, the same grace to wrestle through these questions to wrestle with the scriptures, to wrestle with their belief in God. What if we did that, allowing God to work in their lives, to take as long as it takes, all the while us encouraging, lifting them up, praying, and walking with people along the way? What if parents gave room for their kids to discover a firsthand faith of their very young? You know, Jesus never got um, knocked off center <laughs> or off mission because people didn't believe in him, and he was Jesus, you know? I, I can only imagine that, that well, he gave, his, it, he gave his life so that we might believe in him. He, he gave everything he had so that we might believe in him. But I don't see where, where he got knocked off mission when people didn't. So instead of a lecture, uh, Jesus doesn't get mad at Thomas for his doubt. He doesn't try to debate him with uh, historical data from the prophets. Uh, all the signs and wonders that he'd done, he didn't defensively say, as, as I might have, weren't you paying attention? Don't you remember all the stuff I did, all the stuff I said? Don't you get it? That might have been my response. Instead of all that, Jesus shows Thomas his scars. Let's look again at verse 27. He said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, put it in my side, stop doubting and believe. I... Imagine hesitantly, hesitantly Thomas reached out to touch that scar. Hesitantly, timidly perhaps, he reached out to Jesus' side. Thomas touches the place of Jesus' pain. Now here's a question that I always had. If Jesus had gone to heaven in those three days, we know he descended into hell, but we know that, that he was in the presence of God. Why, why did he still have scars? Why wasn't he healed completely? It's a question I've always had. And You know, if God restored breath to Jesus' lungs, couldn't the scars have been cleared up? And, and today I believe the scars are there for a reason. You know, because Jesus was human. Just like us, Jesus felt pain just like us, and the scars are there as a reminder that he was fully human, but that he had healed. He had healed. And, and I was just thinking there's such a difference between an open wound and a scar. A scar shows this process of healing, and, and, and I think some of us, our doubts come from woundedness that we have. Some of us are wounded, and, and the fact of the matter is, and believe me, I get it, 
The fact of the matter is we don't want to walk through the process of healing to get through it, to learn the lessons God wants to show us. For God wants to reveal things to us, but what we want to do in our woundedness is either um, tend to the wound and make it our, um, our identity or hide from it or run from it. Scars signal that healing has taken place. Wounds still hurt. They still hurt. And sometimes our doubts in God and God's goodness and God's grace and God's love for us are as a result of wounds that we simply have not dealt with. Wounds uh, that are difficult. Really difficult. Now, every once in a while, I doubt. <laughs> I doubt that God desires to give me lasting peace because I have a lifelong, you know this if you've been coming here for any time at all, I've had a lifelong struggle with depression. It's something I work on all the time. When I get down, I doubt God's love. How could he possibly love me? Because what happens to me when I get down, I don't know if this happens to you, but um, I bully myself. I look into my own rear view mirror and, and all the, the sins I've committed in my life or the people I have let down or the times I've failed. I forget what Jesus did for me at the cross. I forget that Jesus came to set me free from all of that. I believe the lies that we sang about when we say fear is a liar. He is a liar. He wants to keep me down. He wants to keep you down. I forget. I forget. I forget. And I believe that I'm not lovable. There are other kinds of wounds. Some uh, wounds that we have in our lives come from outside situations. It's not something that's going on on the, on the inside. Maybe, maybe you have problems calling God Father because your dad was abusive. Maybe you doubt God will provide for you because right now you're in the worst financial place you've ever been in and you can't see a way out. Maybe you doubt God's promises because you're struggling right now. This past 10 months, many of us, many of us, friends, you're not alone, many of us have had more doubts and questions than we've ever had in our lives, doubting God's love, doubting God's goodness, doubting God's grace, doubting God's provision. I want to say to you, believe your beliefs. Doubt your doubts, but believe your beliefs. Hang on to them. We can bring all these doubts to Jesus. He's got huge shoulders. He can take it. And like I said before, he, he already knows you have these doubts. And whether our doubts are due to, to things we've done or experiences we've experienced or, or just trying to deal with this new world that's happening right now and, and all the challenges that we've had, no matter the source of our doubts, Jesus invites us to share them with him and to share them with one another, to share them with, with a Christ follower who's, who's mature and he'll say, it's okay, let's just continue walking this way. As Thomas touched Jesus' scars, Jesus healed his wounded soul. And the entire Gospel of John is a book about belief. I want to encourage you, if you're one of the folks who, who are saying this year, this year, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into the Bible, start with the book of John. It is absolutely fantastic. It tells the story of Jesus, and um, it's a, it is a book about belief. Ninety-six times John calls people 
to believe in Jesus. So when Thomas feels Jesus' scars, he believes in the pinnacle of the whole book. In fact, what may be the pinnacle for yours and my life is if we could get to the point that Thomas got to when he said, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Thomas placed his entire trust in Jesus and, and just like Thomas, I believe Jesus can find us in our doubts. I believe Jesus will meet us exactly where we are. I, I have to tell you, how many times in my life God has met me where I was in my doubt and I've had to say, oh God, I'm so sorry. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me enough. And, and to say thank you for the people around me. Thank you for loving me enough that you didn't give me the boot when I asked what seemed to be childish questions. Does God really love me? Does God really care? Does God really know what's going on in my life? Does God know when I'm suffering or when I'm hurting? Or does God know my, my family member is suffering so much? Does God care? All these questions and so many more can lead us toward a new confidence in Jesus as we persevere as we get comfortable with the doubts, as Jesus meets us in our doubt, and God reveals more and more. God gives us the answers through his word, through a song, through a person, through a sunrise. However, if we're open, if we're willing to be willing to allow God to reveal God's self to us, we'll get some answers. Notice I didn't say all of the answers, right? We're not going to get all of the answers or sometimes, you know, it's yes and sometimes it's no and sometimes it's wait and sometimes it's more will be revealed and sometimes it's like, like you got to go by faith, kid. Just keep going. There's a prayer that we uh, pray around here that I want to share this morning as we begin this new year. Um, there was a guy, he was at the Cape campus, and he, um, he was a greeter, and he was an atheist, and um, just, just really wired that way, but he read a lot of books about theology, and he read a lot of books um, had read the Bible. He was very vocal with his doubt, very vocal with his questions. And, um, but he, he just had this love for people, and whenever he would stand at the door and people would come in, he would open the door and he would say, it's a fantastic day in paradise. Now, what I want to say is that thankfully we were practicing what the disciples had been given and gave others, and that was room for people to learn and room for people to grow and, and room for people to come to faith in Christ. Amen? So Richard, um, great greeter, atheist, was diagnosed with cancer. And he, he, uh, he began to fail really, really quickly, and his uh, cancer caused him to be um, homebound. And even then, when we would go see him as his body began to fail, he, um, you would walk into his room and say, hey, Richard, how you doing? And he'd say, it's another great day in paradise. How could he keep this attitude? Well, Jesus had met him in his doubt. Jesus had met him in his sickness. Jesus had actually met him in his sick bed. You know, um, I uh, preached a funeral yesterday. 
and um, the man whose funeral it is, uh, I was blessed to go and share on Christmas Eve communion with he and his family before we started our services here. And he had started thinking about the things of God. Richard had started thinking about the things of God. When, when you know the, you're knock, knock, knocking on eternity's door, you begin to think about such things if you are blessed with that opportunity. And we had given him a stack of this prayer that we're going to pray in a minute, and he had been handing it out to the doctors and the nurses and the people at the chemo center, and he's like, y'all need to pray this prayer. You, you really, really should pray this prayer. And he had handling, he'd been handing everybody out this prayer. And there came a point in time when he actually prayed it for himself. And his memorial service closed with this prayer. This prayer that had enabled him to say yes to Jesus and to give him all of his questions, all of his doubt, to give him his sickness, to give him his cancer, to give him his pain, to give him his past, and to give him his future. That happened for Richard. And I want to say at the start of this new year together, Let's bring our lives, our past, our present, our future, our doubts, our questions, our everythings <laughs> to Jesus. Let's allow him room to move in our lives. Could you imagine, could you imagine if we got to the place if we knew nothing else this entire year, if we knew nothing else, if we could be like Thomas and just say, my Lord and my God, and to walk around with that knowledge, just to walk around with that presence, you are my Lord and you are my God. Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that change the way we interact? Wouldn't that change how we treat other people? I want to invite us to pray these words together, and then we'll prepare our hearts for Holy Communion. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you, exalted for you, or brought low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious, blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine. I am yours, so be it. In the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Friends, if we got to the point where we said, you are mine and I am yours, if that was the drumbeat of our lives, it would be a beautiful thing. I want to challenge you to make that the drumbeat of your life. Write this down. You are mine, I am yours. You are mine, I am yours. With every beat of my heart, you are mine, I am yours. I want to challenge you to say that several times through the day and then see. See how God reveals God's self to you. See the doors that open up for you to share this love with other people. You are mine, I am yours. Jesus paid the most incredible price so that you would be able to say those words. He went to the cross and died so that we could be his and he could be ours. And the night before he did that, he had dinner with those disciples that we talked about. 
And he broke bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take this and eat it and when you do, remember me. And he took a cup and he praised God. He gave him thanks and praise and he said, when you drink from this cup, remember me. And so in union with each other, in union with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we take these elements from these little containers that we have. We will be back communing one day, the old-fashioned way. <laughs> but we take these elements and we remember. We remember Christ's suffering on the cross. We remember him rising from the dead. And we ask him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to meet us in our doubts. And we thank you, God, for loving us where we are and not wanting to leave us there. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Please receive your elements. Our God is great. 
Let's go from this place saying, you're my God, I'm your girl. You're my God, I'm your guy. I'm your guy. Let this be the drumbeat of our lives. Amen? Amen. Go with God. <laughs> 